Wakomako Werewolf versus Maryland Catman. Dear Scary Stories NYC, Just days before our marriage, my wife and I saw not just the dogman, but we saw him battling what turned out to be something of a local Maryland legend, the Wakomako Catman. I met my bride-to-be who we're going to call Patricia in New York City, where we both attended grad school and then cohabitated after graduation, sharing an apartment in Upper Manhattan. When we decided to get married, she went home a full month before the wedding to plan it out with her mother and grandmother. For Pat, home still means Wacomaco County, home of some pretty unique cryptid encounter tales. Wacomaco County is located on an island whose ownership is split between three states. The eastern part of the island near New Jersey is called Delaware. The southernmost tip is considered part of Virginia, and the western chunk belongs to Maryland. Wacomaco County, being in the center of the island, is considered part of Maryland, bordering directly on Delaware. I got to Maryland a week before the wedding, and Patricia's old-fashioned parents had us sleeping in separate rooms. It was the 1990s, but Pat had not gotten up the nerve to tell her parents that she had a sexual relationship with her boyfriend and fiancé. So the two of us found ourselves behaving like teenagers in spite of being almost 30 and about to be married. I would have to make one excuse about where I was going to be, and Patricia would have to make another excuse, and then we would both sneak off to be together. Initially, our primary secret meeting spot was Brick Kiln Road. This was a little two-lane mini-highway, hidden in the woods, looking spooky no matter the weather or time of day. Brick Kiln Road's sole purpose seemed to be to allow the garbage trucks to get to town and to take the garbage back with them to the dump through those creepy-looking woods. Patricia told me it was a classic lover's lane dating back to the 70s because A, it was hidden away in the woods, B, it was one long stretch of dark, unlit, and forested road that wasn't being used all that much, and best of all, it smelled like garbage, so the cops and adults generally avoided it like the plague. It also had a history associated with particularly savage and terrifying cryptid sightings, which I will summarize later. I had not heard any of that, though, and Pat had never believed in monsters up to that point in her life. She sided with the majority on everything in those days, and since the majority did not yet believe in cryptids, then she didn't either. Actually, I don't even think we knew the word cryptid in those days. Since I was from New York City, the animals I was afraid of were things like those giant New York rats that sometimes swarmed through parks and chase human beings down the street. Of course, I only read about those stories in the local newspapers, so I don't know if they're actually true. Supposedly, rats sometimes really swarm through Central Park. Maybe that's an urban legend made up to sell newspapers, but then again, that's what Patricia and I thought Dogman and Bigfoot and other so-called monsters were. Myths created to drum up tourism. We were not against small towns making up legends and selling t-shirts. In fact, that kind of stuff was cool to most people in my generation back then. We're the ones who revived or maybe perfected spooky tourism after all. So on this night in question, days before our wedding, I snuck off, saying I was doing one thing. Pat said she was doing something else. Then we met up and drove over to the dark woods on Brick Kiln Road, parking off the road in the shadows behind some vegetation. We hoped we were invisible and got to work with the heavy petting. I don't remember how long we were going at it when something landed loudly on the car hood, causing the car itself to bounce and causing Pat to nearly bite my tongue off. That was quite painful, believe me. It made it hard for me to talk for days afterward. I'm lucky it wasn't a lot worse than that, though. So because I was coping with extreme levels of pain in the short term, Pat was watching the thing on our hood a lot more closely than I was. 
She told me that she screamed, seeing this thing there that looked like a big black panther, and at the same time, just didn't look like a panther at all. She had thought that the creature was attacking our vehicle, but she said it never acted like it was interested in me or her at all. Instead, it turned nervously to look back in the direction it had come from. It was acting as though it were being followed, and it seemed extraordinarily nervous about whatever was following it. I was beginning to notice things beyond my extreme tongue pain around this point. I marveled at the size of this big cat in one moment, then recoiled in disgust as it moved its body in ways that no cat should ever be able to move. Before I was able to get any of this to make even the slightest bit of sense inside my brain, another, even larger hairy beast dove onto the hood of the car, attempting to grab the cat-like humanoid. Neither grabbed the other, but both succeeded in sliding off our hood toward the road to our left. Whereas the first animal looked like an African panther, the second one looked like nothing other than a big brown werewolf. It had a wolf-like canine cranium over a football player's shoulder pad shoulders. When it stood up on its hind legs, it looked like a computer animation. It was far too large to have been a man in a costume. Next to us, we heard terrible sounds, like a cat and a dog literally tearing each other apart. I got out a small flashlight and shone it on the two dark battling forms, revealing that there was, in fact, a canine creature attacking the feline one. The thing is, neither of them appeared normal, and my first thought was literally that these animals must be from a different planet. I think I've made it clear that I was uninterested in cryptids or UFOs in those days, and yet even so, when I saw that cat-like man and that dog-like one trying to rip each other to shreds, I felt absolutely certain I was watching a fight between two space aliens. If nothing else, that should tell you how utterly bizarre this scene was that we had happened upon. So at this point, we were watching these two creatures battling on the road and on the grassy knoll we were parked on. The feline looked like a big cat, like an African panther, at least when he was down on all fours. When he stood up, however, his front legs seemed to fold back into long arms, and his chest seemed to broaden into one more like a man's than a feline's. The same kind of thing was true for the larger canine figure. He would stand up to an enormous seven feet or taller, move in for an attack on the big cat, only to be met with a savage counter-attack from the feline's claws or teeth. Then when the cat took the offensive, the upright canine would drop to all fours and race away. The two beasts continued to circle each other quadrupedally, waiting and watching for any sign of weakness. When one or the other thought he saw a chance, he stood up quickly and fiercely and insanely began swinging and snapping at the other one. It was clear the dog-headed man had the advantage in terms of height and body mass, but the cat had the advantage of being completely out of its mind, as all cats have the capacity for. Brick Kiln Road is just two lanes, and those two cryptids were blocking both of them. It felt like any attempt we made at escape would only be drawing attention to ourselves and asking for trouble. So we sat there waiting and watching the greatest drive-in show ever. For a while, the battling followed the same repeat pattern of the aggressor standing up on his hind legs and charging the other one as the opponent would drop down to a quadrupedal stance and unleash a flurry of claws and fangs. Then the situation would reverse, and it was hard to tell who was winning. When the big black cat jumped to a low-hanging branch and began climbing a tall tree, I thought the cat had won. Dogs are generally terrible at climbing trees. Well, even if that is true, not all dog men are bad climbers. This brown one took off after the cat, up the tree. He then followed his leap to the next tree, and the next. 
At first we watched this remarkable chase through the treetops. Then we listened and noted where the leaves were falling and the trees were shaking. After some time we had no idea where either beast was any longer, and so I did what any red-blooded American male would do. I started necking with my fiancé again. Of course, she was no longer in the mood, and I was rebuffed. In those days, if parents weren't cramping my style, then it seemed mythological creatures were. I was genuinely relieved when we got married, and I've never regretted doing it once. Well, not more than once. Or twice. Well, maybe a handful of times, but rarely. That's the point. I've rarely regretted it since. So, we didn't talk about this sighting until after the wedding, for obvious reasons, but when we did, everyone told us the same thing. The Catman we saw was the Wacomico Catman, which had last been seen in 1980, which was like 12 years prior to this time. And where was it seen that time? About a mile in front of us, on the same road we were on. It was seen closer to the garbage dump than our noses allowed us to go, but really very close by. That time it attacked two cars full of teenagers and tried to break into one of them, apparently breaking one of its nails off in the process. Patricia realized when she heard the story that she had heard it before. It's just that before she thought it was an urban legend, a variation on the story of the hook man. After we saw that cryptid battle that we saw, however, Pat now thinks the 1980 Catman sighting is probably a true report. Certainly, we saw a creature from the same species, and perhaps even the exact same animal. We're no longer in a place to disbelieve others, are we? I'm very happy to have our own home to live in these days. I'm glad that my wife and I no longer have to venture out in the dark night in search of some privacy. And never again will either of us have to lay eyes upon <laughs> the Wacomico Werewolf versus the Maryland Catman. What's better than a Dogman story? That's easy. Two Dogman stories. Which is why we're declaring this week Double Down Dogman Week. We're going to have not one, but two Dogman stories per day, one at 10 a.m. and the other at 7 p.m. That's 10 shows in five days, Monday, March 14th through Friday, March 18th, right here on Scary Stories NYC. Sexy Kojak, he's the man. Werewolf Talkback is the plan. Whether you're tight or somewhat slack, you gotta love that sexy Kojak. Please join us in thanking Sexy Kojak for making this episode possible. He gets lots of our perks, and now here's international spokesmongrel Henry Lee Dogman to explain the deets. Hank. Thanks for watching till the end. If you liked what you saw, please consider clicking like on the video or sharing it with your friends and family that you think might also be interested. If you would like to see more of our work, please consider subscribing and hitting that bell icon next to the subscribe button so that YouTube will alert you when we put out a new video. To become a channel member and gain access to our special perks, you can click that join link under each of our videos. Another option is to join our PayPal subscribers club at peterbernard.com. You can join for as little as 99 cents on YouTube or a buck 50 at peterbernard.com and that gains you access to our weekly secret uncensored episodes. If you'd like to see our 21 hours of archives of uncensored Dogman stories, then please join at the $3 level or above. To get to watch our shows in advance of the public, please join at our $10 level. That gets you all the perks. If you join our channel memberships, you need to check our community page here on YouTube in order to get the links to the secret videos and other perks. If you're in the PayPal Subscribers Club, Peter will email you all the news and links himself. Once joining the PayPal Club, which is Peter's homemade club, please give him a chance to see that you've joined and to compose you a personal welcome email, as none of that is automated. But whichever you join, 
We'll name you an executive producer for the next available episode. Do you have a scary experience that you'd like to share with us? You can email us at scarystoriesnyc at gmail.com or call our Scary Stories voicemail hotline at 804 Lascary. That's 804 537 2279. It's a Google voicemail box, so that means it keeps cutting off after every three minutes. If your story is longer than that, Please keep calling back, and we can piece it together on our end. Good night, and have a scary tomorrow. Come back for more. Scary stories.